There are days that define your story beyond your life. Like the day they arrived. Sometimes what might be called first contact. The objects measure at least... I'm Colonel G.T. Webber from the Intelligence. Pack your bags. You're at the top of everyone's list when it comes to translations. Priority one. What do they want? Where are they from? You'll be reporting to me, but you'll be working with him when you're in the show. That's what they call the UFO. Scott, have you seen Arrival? I have seen Arrival. I've read the novella, The Story of Your Life uh, by Ted Chang as well. And uh, it's uh, it's probably my favorite science fiction film of the century so far. Well, we're on the same page there. I'd, I'd say it's mine too, probably. And uh, uh, I like it because I, I think it's the best portrayal of aliens and of alien intelligence maybe ever in a movie, but certainly since the very subtle but really interesting portrayal of alien intelligence in 2001, A Space Odyssey. And I would agree. And I think that the strength of it for me is the fact that uh, unlike most Hollywood films, it really gives you uh, an intelligent look at this like the way that the literature does. Here the aliens are, you know, they're alien. They're truly alien. They're not humans. They're not like humans. And the fact that the film focuses in on language is just brilliant. Who's the lead character? Uh, a college professor who's a linguist. You know, who they bring in, Amy Adams, they bring her in to figure out the alien language. How, how do you communicate with these aliens? And, and then, of course, it becomes about much more than language. It becomes about time travel and, and perceptions of reality and physics experienced in a different way. It's aliens well beyond human capability. Um, and, uh, and there's, there is more of that. I, it's part of why we're doing this, this show on our favorite sci-fi of the 21st century, because I think they have, as time has gone by, it's not like the classic sci-fi so much that's, you know, action and monsters, but now there's more, maybe much more influence from the literature, from writers like Philip K. Dick, who's had Several movies made, uh, several of his short stories or novels made into movies, and he was the master of writing about alternate realities. And, and uh, a lot of directors are, uh, there's a number of movies on our list that, uh, that are those kind of subtle stories. And then, of course, there's also the epic adaptation of Frank Herbert's Dune novel. Before we talk about Dune and, and, and kind of go through our list that we, you and I have looked together, and we have a lot of the same favorite movies, um, uh, we should talk a little bit about 2001 A Space Odyssey. When we did our classic sci-fi episode, we ended with 2001 and we just sort of said it changed everything. That when that movie came, it sort of said this whole era of sci-fi films is over. And, it, and ever since then, it's been the most influential science fiction movie ever made, really, in terms of what's come in the 50 years since. Definitely. And, and I think one of the strengths for 2001 is that it was made during the time when we were going to the moon, when the general public could watch news footage and see what it was like to walk in space or what it was like for spacecraft to to be out there. And the fact that it it um, uh, it sh every time that people are in space or every time you see an exterior of a of the spaceship, it's silent. It's following the actual laws of science. Yeah, so that was one major thing it did. It said no more of this goofy, like, you know, zap guns and goofy-looking aliens and, and space travel that, that hap seems to happen instantaneously. And all that. 2001 was very realistic, no sound in space. It was the first movie that I know of to do that, um, where, because there's no air in space, there's no sound in, in deep space. And also showing that the... The astronauts who were out there were basically bored. It's this months-long ride to Jupiter, and there's not much to do. It's kind of mundane. But he lulls you in with this mundane stuff in the movie because I won't be giving away much, because even if people haven't seen it, it's such a complex movie, and you have to see it a couple times. You know, it ultimately is, is about really the, the, the way the human race came about and millions of years on Earth, and then... This ultra, we never see the aliens in that movie, but there's this obvious, incredibly high intelligence behind everything. And also, uh, mentioning Arrival, this is the precursor to that in terms of presenting aliens as truly alien. 
as unlike humanity and and uh, uh, beyond the, the the way that the human mind cannot encompass them in a way. Yeah, they're they they look completely. They're kind of they look a little bit like octopuses or something. But they're but but beyond that's that, an arrival. But in two thousand and one, we don't see them at all. We don't see them at all. But an arrival, you know, they look really weird. They have to be behind a, a kind of force field because they obviously don't breathe the same atmosphere or whatever. And you can't communicate with them at all in the beginning. And then the communication itself becomes the key to the movie and and kind of the key to to alternate physics and alternate perception of time and um, make it just a fascinating movie where we all kind of think that. We think, well, if there is intelligence that's out there that's that's beyond ours, they would be living by kind of different rules and laws, even laws of physics. And that in this movie, that's what it is. Well, let's go through our list. I have a list written in reverse order, <laughs> starting with the most recent. And uh, interestingly, the most the, on my list going from 2022, I don't I only have one on 2021, all the way back to the turn of the century, the first three, the most three most recent, are all by the same director, the French-Canadian director, Denis Villeneuve. And I would argue he's the greatest director right now working of science fiction because he made Dune, which people have different views, but I think it's masterful. I think it's a great movie and uh, in some ways even improves on the book, which is widely regarded by many people as the greatest science fiction novel. He did Blade Runner 2049, which was sort of, you know, a job for hire, obviously. They needed someone to do the sequel, but this is one of those really good sequels that, that goes its own route. Blade Runner 2049 is just not some, like, lesser version of the original Blade Runner from the 80s. Um, and Harrison Ford is in it. Uh, Ryan Gosling and Anna de Armas are the co-stars. But it's terrific. And then there's Arrival. So just on the strength of those three... Um, it's pretty amazing. The only other, I was trying to think what other director has been, done a bunch of sci-fi in the 21st century. Um, and guess who? Steven Spielberg, you know, the guy who did Close Encounters in E.T. has done, I, I noted four sci-fi films that he's done. Um, two of them are kind of forgettable, War of the Worlds, a remake of War of the Worlds and Ready Player One. Which, which was the, the most recent one. The most recent. That's a young adult novel. Those are both okay. But the ones that I think are really good are AI, artificial intelligence, which is a fa fantastic uh, exploration right at the turn of the century. Which uh, was uh, actually a Stanley Kubrick idea that uh, who made 2001 that Spielberg took on. Yeah, and that's one of those ironies because you could argue that Steven Spielberg is one of the most sentimental, romantic filmmakers ever. And Spielberg was totally unsentimental. I mean, you mean uh, Kubrick. Uh, Stanley Kubrick was unsentimental. But this he was, was almost cold in a he way. He was. And, and this was near the end of his life. And he couldn't get the robot right. And he gave the project to Spielberg. It's one more evidence of Kubrick's brilliance. Because people, people who love Kubrick would say, oh, he's not a jerk like Spielberg. He doesn't make these romantic movies with John Williams, you know, uh, emotional scores throughout them. He tells a real story. And it turns out, no, they were actually friends. And he respected what Spielberg could do. And he thought Spielberg could make this boomy better than I could. And it came out pretty good, I think. It did. And in fact, uh, one of the things that I, I think is brilliant about the movie, and this is not a big spoiler because it's a, it's a big sprawling movie with a lot of different things. But by the end of it, the aliens are actually the humanity. Mostly it's a near future story of a family that doesn't have a child or they've lost their, their child and they they get a, a, a robotic child who is indistinguishable from, you know, they're so perfect, they seem like humans. And it brings up this wonderful question about what is the nature of a human being? Because this kid is, you know, the, the, the robot is programmed just to love these parents, the mother, unconditionally. And what do we owe that, that being, you know, who's intelligent and learns and... Um, uh, but then it, 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 towards the end, without giving, it, this won't give away anything. You have to watch the movie, but it jumps like 2000 years in time. And people argue about that ending as to whether those beings are aliens or future highly intelligent robots. Leave it to the viewer to decide. But anyway, going back before that, before the wonderful three Denise Villeneuve movies, my next one going backwards in time is 2015 
Mad Max Fury Road. George Miller returning to the Mad Max universe and doing it in a way that was critically acclaimed. To me, it's the greatest action movie ever made. It just, you know, it's just so, it's nonstop, amazing action the whole time, but also a very compelling, interesting science fiction story in there. And, you know, at a time when there's all sorts of TV shows on that you could see that are post-apocalyptic and uh, carrying on in some ways the tradition of the original Mad Max, and then Miller just comes in and says, this is the way you do it. Yeah, because it's, it, it's fun in a way. You can in, enjoy it. It's not like totally depressing dystopian future, right? It, it's, it's invigorating to watch this action, and yet it does have a very strong story. And then Her is one that I have not seen, directed by Spike Jones, And it's another one about, isn't it, Uh, just having remembered the previews, it's about what is human, uh, uh, is, is, is an artificial intelligence, is that something that a human can make a connection with? Right, it's very much about that. It's, it's a romance. Uh, Joaquin Phoenix is the lead, and Joaquin Phoenix falls in love with his AI, you know, kind of a Siri-like thing. You never see her, the title of the movie, the voice, voiced by Scarlett Johansson, but you know, in every way, it seems like a real bond, like a relationship. And, and he takes her to be utterly human. Um, but of course, she's not. <laughs> so that, that, that's another very interesting. And, and that one is one of those many science fiction movies that feels like this could happen. You know, how far are we going to go with artificial intelligence? And, and given how artificial, not artificial intelligence, but uh, how uh, algorithms on, on computers and on the Internet are affecting people's behavior. Yeah. And then uh, in 2010, you have Inception, Christopher Nolan. It's considered a masterpiece of science fiction. Uh, I just you you've been uh, aware of this film since 2010. I just watched it. And it's an amazing film. It's an absolutely incredible and it's very philip k dickian even though it's not based on a, on a philip k dick book or story yeah dick was the master of like you know he sets up one level of reality and then there's sort of like another level or a, a reality within that reality and of course inception is about these these artificially created dreams they're sort of uh engineered they're not true dream but they're to get inside some, some a person's mind to be able to get them to get information from them or to get them to do something. And, you know, the movie ends up being about what dream within a dream within a dream is multiple levels. 